welcome. We're going to get started. You can have a seat. Um, we're going to get started. Thank you for all for coming, and we're going to um, have a couple um, words. People are going to say a couple words about Judy before she gives her talk, and then afterwards we'll have a reception in the back. So please stay around for the reception. We have a nice photograph um, that's going to be a gift uh, for Judy of the uh, center, and in the margins we'd like you to sign your names. We have colorful markers so that she can take that with her to her um, new place and hang it in her office and remember us. Um, so I'd like to invite um, Dean Silver to come first and take a walk in the stage. Well, it's really a great pleasure to be here and so wonderful to see this, this fabulous turnout uh, for, for Judy's talk. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. It's, uh, it's really an honor to be here to kick this wonderful event off um, in commemoration of Judy Kroll's many outstanding accomplishments and contributions to Penn State. So uh, to prepare for this little introduction, I did some asking around. Uh, and by that I mean I had a good long talk with Julie Ducius. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to learn just how the, the phenomenon that is Judy Kroll uh, came to be. Uh, so uh, here's some things that I learned. Um, it all started in the mid-90s in what was then referred to, to the, uh, by those in the know as Judy's Purple Lab. Um, and Judy had painted it purple because purple was the best uh, color to cover the black uh, walls that she had inherited. I guess it was some kind of visual, visual lab, so it needed to have black walls. So, so they went with purple. Um, and it was here that the, the first inklings of what would become the Center for Language Science began to take shape. The initial group consisted of uh, two faculty members and a few students, but by 2004 it had grown organically to over 30 people who regularly participated in uh, what they called Judy's lab meetings. Right? So these are, these are insider terms I'm using. Um, the group quickly outgrew the lab and moved to the larger room across the hall at which time it began calling itself the Language Science Research Group. And this name remained until the dean authorized the creation of the Center for Language Science in 2006 in recognition of what Judy had created. As many of you know, a defining feature of Judy's leadership is her strong emphasis on inclusiveness and community building. <laughs> You're all a testament to that. Uh, from the beginning, the Center for Language Science included faculty in German, Spanish, psychology, and the Department of Communication Science and Disorders in the College of Health and U Human Development. Uh, and in fact, the first directors of the center were Judy and Adele Michio in CSD. Another defining feature of Judy's leadership is her focus on bringing research opportunities to both graduate and undergraduate students. Thus, shortly after the center was established, Judy and her colleagues applied for an NSF Pyre grant for those of you who don't know, stands for Partnership uh, for International Research and Education. Uh, and this was to enable them to support the research of graduate and undergraduate students. They won that grant, which was a remarkable accomplishment for a team of social scientists, uh, because Pyre grants are mostly awarded to faculty in the sciences. The grant has enabled the team to support faculty and students in conducting language science research uh, for over five years now. And then last year, the team uh, did what nobody thought would be possible, which is they won a second Pyre grant. Uh, so, you know, the first rec uh, accomplishment was uh, remarkable, remarkable enough. The second one was, uh, you know, tru truly an incredible feat. So these grants, with support from the college and from the university, have enabled the center to hire uh, recently graduated undergraduates as lab managers uh, within the center. And these positions are important to Judy because they enable undergraduates to develop into competent researchers and are often a springboard to graduate school. In fact, over half the lab managers hired by the center have gone on to graduate school, including at places such as Northwestern and Pitt. Now, in a school as large as Penn State, this kind of intensive learning and career building experience um, you know, can be hard to come by. So the, the center is really special in being able to provide that. Another remarkable outcome of Judy's community building efforts has been her success in fostering cross-disciplinary research and training between the language departments and the Department of Psychology. So many, uh, many across the country have tried to do this, as, as you probably know, and have failed. Uh, yet today, Penn State has a thriving dual title PhD program in language science, 
uh, spanning these departments. The program provides language students with, with training in psychological methods and uh, provides psychology students with training in linguistics. The training provided in this dual title PhD program has enabled what many, uh, what many thought also to be impossible, which is the placement of language PhDs in uh, psychology postdocs and tenure track positions. Right? That is a, a really remarkable uh, achievement and one that really makes the center stand out nationally. As a testament to the success of Judy's community building efforts, every day uh, I hear between 80 and 100 scholars from across these departments uh, gather to hear talks on language science, and, uh, and this happens you know, weekly. This, I said every week, did I say every day? <laughs> I meant every week, sorry. <laughs> that, would, <I> just, <laughs> that would be a lot of work. <laughs> Uh, this, this, uh, this thriving intellectual community, student engagement, and grant success make the Center for Language Science one of the most successful centers we have in the college uh, at, of all time, actually. Now, uh, Judy would, of course, be the first to say that all of these accomplishments have been group efforts. She's nodding her head. Uh, but those close to Judy are quick to acknowledge that without Judy's vi vision, energy, and wisdom, none of these accomplishments would have been possible. Uh, so, Judy, you've been a true mover and shaker here at Penn State and a, a wonderful colleague and mentor to so many. Um, and I, I want to thank you for all that you've done uh, to make Penn State a better place. And, um, and I think I speak for all of us when I say you're going to be uh, missed greatly. I mean, it's an understatement and it's hard to express how much you'll be missed. Um, so uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Julie up here to the podium. Well, I have so many things to say, so many stories to talk about that I don't know where to begin with. And so I'm going to do what my good Italian and common sense heritage tells me to do, and I'm going to start at the end. Uh, Judy, what you have done to bring together faculty and students in departments of, in language departments, in communication science and disorders, and in psychology, in this seamless weave uh, is truly unparalleled. Um, I know of many people that have thought about these things and, uh, and have quickly shied away because of the sheer amount of work that it would require. But you did it, you built the center, and, uh, and you made it look so easy. And, uh, but I know about the many sacrifices that you did to build the center. I know about the many things you gave up to do this. And, um, and I know how much you have had to stick your neck out many times for these things to happen. And I remember the first time I walked into the Purple Lab, and I think the room was 623, was it 623? I think so. And I remember, look, Bianca, was it 623? <laughs> yeah. And I remember looking at the purple walls and then you showed me your lab and it was a very modest lab. And I remember it had a few um, large Mac computers and a couple of button boxes and some software called SciScope. <laughs> that helped us do all this research. And, and I remember thinking that how from something so modest, so many wonderful things could come up and come out. And, but this is exactly what you do. What you do is from something very small, you can build something that is very big. And um, I think that uh, I speak for everybody here when I say that you have been a pioneer that um, what you have done is really remarkable. Uh, you have built this marvelous center for all of us, and you have done it by being inclusive, by respecting what we do, and by your tremendous generosity. And I think it must have been an Italian who <laughs> said that it doesn't matter how much sugar you put in your coffee. 
If you don't stir it, it will never become sweet. Mm -hmm. And Judy, you have been the person who has stirred the coffee that now leaves this very sweet, sweet center for all of us. Thank you very much. Get ready. Give me a minute here. Okay, I'm going to repeat a lot of what uh, Dean Silver and also Julie Ducey has said. I'll try to be as original as possible. After nearly 45 years in this profession, watching people and programs come and go, I think it's safe to say that I've witnessed my share of successes and disappointments. More often than not, the fate of programs is tied to the abilities and efforts of a charismatic leader who inspires those around her. For many years, linguistics and the broader language sciences at Penn State was a solid but isolated discipline. It was searching for a way to have a greater impact on the university community. It needed a strong and determined leader to take it there. That special person who came to Penn State in 1994. She combined all the talents needed for the task of invigorating the study of language at this university. When she arrived at Penn State, she hit the ground running, sorry for the sports metaphor, and has never slowed down. <laughs> I couldn't avoid it. She's a wonderful teacher, an energetic organizer, an efficient manager, a terrific colleague, and a high-profile national and international scholar. She has the ability, talent, and willingness to set high goals and to meet them. She successfully addresses a rigorous scientific research program while tending to the needs of students, staff, and colleagues. Can you guess who this is? Do you need a clue? That Wonder Woman is Judy Kroll. Among the many colleagues and students who have taught or studied at Penn State, in my view, there is not one who has had a greater impact on linguistics and the language sciences than Judy Krull. Judy has broadened the study of language through the establishment and development of the Center for Language Science. She has raised it from a modest enterprise to a virtual powerhouse. In the process, language science, sciences have exchanged their windowless offices in the old Moore building for a permanent wing in the new Trump Towers, also known as the old, the new Moore building. <laughs> to get an idea of the growth and activities in language science, just have a look at the CLS website. It reports a seemingly endless stream of grants, research initiatives, programs of study, including the highly successful dual degree program, postdocs, eyebrow raising placements of graduate students and tenure track jobs attention in the local and national media, NSF Pyre weekly, weekly lectures, all done with a signature that says Judy Kroll in Penn State. Wow. And that's before 5 a.m., no matter what time zone she's in. <laughs> We've all had those messages at 3.37. <laughs> of course, Judy didn't accomplish this all by herself. I couldn't begin to mention all the people who have worked just as hard. I will, however, tip my hat to Judy's husband, David Rosenbaum, who I call the incomparable one, who's made his own mark on the field of cognition and motor control during his time at Penn State. Judy Kroll has inspired us all to do better, to push for success when status quo seemed easier, all with a gentle and ever helpful attitude that comforts us and makes us feel as though we belong. I suspect everyone in this room will miss Judy and will be emailing her for her sage advice. I know, I don't know about you, I plan to go one step further and knock on her door in California after 5 a.m. <laughs> you would step up here for a second. 
a little something. It's not much, but it does capture the notion. Open it up. Hold it up for everybody. One of them, and it's got a cape. <laughs> we didn't worry about what size it was. We figured you weren't going to wear it anyway. Thanks, Phil. So, um, for those of you who don't know me, which is very few, my name is Lauren Parati. I'm a current PhD student in the Spanish department. And I've been at Penn State for eight years. I've been here a while. And it's a big task to try to be a voice for the other students in this moment, but uh, I'll do my best and I, I hope I do justice to all of you as we thank Judy. I've been thinking a lot um, about something you said, actually, in December. And it was about what my plans after Penn State were. And uh, Judy said to me, you should invest in yourself. And at first, I thought about it in a really personal way. I can't look at you. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like look at uh, Richard Page. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, I know you'll smile. <laughs> so I, you know, I was thinking about it really from a selfish personal perspective, you know, like, hmm, does that mean, you know, should I go for a postdoc? What does that mean for me? And then I started to think about it. actually over time, I can't look at you either, you're worse. So the, <laughs> so I started to think about actually that that's something that Judy and the CLS has been instilling in us my whole time here, encouraging us to invest in ourselves and in many different ways. Two major examples of big investments um, were mentioned briefly already, but one is the growth of the CLS. So I've been very lucky um, to be part of the Center for Language Science for eight years. Um, Carrie Jackson and Julie were my professors my first semester as a freshman, and they wrote me into doing some interdisciplinary psycholinguistic research, you know, which is a brand new topic. But it was fun. And I um, was in the basement of Moore with the eye tracker, and it was a really nice place to be, and we were doing great work, and everyone was together, which was really nice. But there are a couple instances, you know, where some plaster from the ceiling fell on a participant's head, or, you know, I had to run down the hall to ask Jorge for some help. So it's amazing to see how, over time, things have grown. And I thank Judy for that. And we see the beautiful new Moore building we, all, we were in and where we came from when we were in Thomas. And so much has changed and developed over this time, especially our Friday meetings that are now so strong. And as we do travel, and I'm not sure if you've all had a similar experience, but people we've brought to talk at the CLS, now whenever I go to their university, I hear about the CLS and the talks and what a strong community is. And it makes me so proud. The second thing that was very a uh, huge investment to the Center for Language Science and its students was the PIRE. And I know we talk about it a lot and we can't get enough of it and it's for good reason. So I was one of the first students to march up into the Purple Lab and ask Judy, travel, funding? All right, let's do this. And it really not only opened my eyes as a traveler, but also as a researcher, and it gave me a platform. And what we've seen over the years is now we've all had this chance, or many of us have had this chance, to build an international research platform, thanks to the Pyre. It's also made us global citizens and understand how research works around the world and around the nation. And it's really helped prepare those of us who are students for our next step. I don't know that I would have been able to get into a graduate program if I didn't have the research experience from the Center for Language Science to support my ambitions. 
And this is not to mention for the students the countless letters of recommendations, the talks, the workshops, the conferences, the random tugging of her arm and advice in the hallway of more. And we're very thankful for your support. Right now I'm going to ask you all to indulge me in a little exercise. Please think about whether you've been able to travel or conduct research or had scholarships supported by the CLS. If you partici participated in PIRE as a student, as a postdoc, as a faculty member, if you're a faculty member, if you sent students, if you've received other travel support or research support, such as the Adele Micho Award, conference reimbursements, anything like that. If the answer is yes, could you please stand up? I think this is a testament to how Judy has helped us invest in ourselves and how the center has invested in, in us. Please join me in thanking Judy. In order to continue the tradition of Penn State and the Center for Language Science investing in their students, I'm honored to announce the Judith F. Kroll Student Travel Award in honor of Judy. This will be awarded to undergraduate or graduate students to travel for research purposes. And Judy, if you would come up, I'd just like to present you with this award. Thank you so much. <laughs> At this time, I'd like to introduce Karen, who will get um, everything set up for Judy's talk. Uh, yeah, if you could set that up. So it's my pleasure to now introduce um, Judy's talk. Um, Judy is a distinguished professor of psychology, linguistics, and women's studies here at Penn State University. She completed her undergraduate degree at New York University and graduate degrees at Brandeis University. And she has held faculty positions at Swarthmore College, Rutgers University, and Mount Holyoke before joining Penn State in 1994. The research that Judy conducts concerns the way that bilinguals juggle the presence of two languages in one mind and brain. Her research, supports, her research, supported by dozens of grants from the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, not to mention the PIRE, shows that bilingualism provides a tool for revealing the interplay between language and cognition, an interplay that is otherwise obscure in speakers of one language alone. It goes without saying that Judy is one of today's leading experts in bilingualism and language science research. She has published over 100 research articles, I counted, <laughs> and has published two books on bilingualism. She was also in 2013 the recipient of a very prestigious Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Award for her project entitled Bilingual Minds and Brains. In addition, uh, but in addition to being a prolific researcher, she's also a very dedicated teacher. She has advised over 50 doctoral dissertations and has sat on the committee of, of hundreds of graduate students, I also counted, um, who themselves have gone on to carry out research on bilingualism and have been very successful in doing so. Um, today, Judy is going to present a talk uh, entitled, A Bilingual Advantage, Conducting Research on Bilingualism in a Community of Language Scientists. Please join me in welcoming Judy. Okay, before I begin, I just want to say thank you for this honor, and it's very embarrassing and, and humbling to be here. Um, I also want to say that despite everything everyone just said, that this is not about me. This is something about this community. And I know that you're try you tried very hard to say that I was going to say that, and we all believe in various priming, a lot of you study priming phenomena in the lab, and think that if you've heard it that you won't be quite as sensitive to it. Um, but the truth is that this is about a community that came together, uh, and I just happened to be sitting in, in a place at the right moment where I was able to be part of it, and I'm really grateful for that. So I thought uh, Karen asked me if I would do a, a half hour talk about my research. It's a little hard to do that today, but I'm going to try to do that uh, a little bit uh, and try to place the research that so many of my students 
uh, and collaborators have participated with me uh, in pursuing in this context for why I think having the Center for Language Science has been and will be in the future so special. Uh, the idea of a bilingual advantage is something, as most of you know, is a hot potato issue at the moment. If you read the media, you listen to the media, you know there's a lot of discussion about bilingualism. We hear a lot about how bilinguals may be advantaged relative to their pathetic monolingual counterparts. Um, that bilingualism may really be a workout for the brain, that, that using two languages may have consequences that go far beyond uh, just language itself and the ability to use two languages. And at the same time, um, there is a sort of debate raging, there is controversy raging where other people have said, well, maybe the case for the bilingual advantage has been overstated. Maybe we're putting too, much, too many of our eggs in one basket. Maybe this is really, uh, uh, maybe this has been exaggerated. Uh, and there has been a lot of controversy. We've had many, many lab meetings discussing these uh, issues. But one thing is absolutely <coughs> certain, and that's that there has been an explosion of research on bilingualism in this last period. The data on the left um, are uh, data from Web of Science uh, showing that, and I think this goes until 2012, starts at 1993, and what you see are just a number of papers published on the search for the topic bilingualism, and you see this marked upsurge of research. And the data on the right are data for citations of those papers, and likewise you see this upsurge. So what we see is that there's tremendous interest in this topic. And the CLS has been a key contributor to this upsurge. It's not we have to be modest about, it's not just our group, but we have certainly um, been uh, participants uh, in this uh, change. Uh, so we are on the map. But a question that I get asked a lot when I go out and give talks and people have stereotypes about central Pennsylvania, uh, they say, how on earth do you do research on bilingualism there? Uh, and my response to it is say, well, we do it by collaborating with each other and by seeking out collaborators in other locations in the world, either where bilingualism is more prevalent or where bilingualism takes different forms. And of course, we have the pyre, and the pyre, as we all know, uh, has been a, a, just a fantastic resource for really uh, fueling um, our ability to do this kind of research, to extend our uh, connections and relationships with uh, researchers in many different places in the world. Um, and we are now, as, as someone who is the mother of twins, uh, we are the very proud recipients of twin pyres. For the next year, we will be uh, in that twin position, which is really quite, quite uh, special. Um, so what I want to do um, today is I'm going to argue that the CLS itself is a kind of bilingual advantage. Um, that together with our colleagues and collaborators that we've contributed to moving the field forward um, by working together, um, by having our students work together, uh, and by celebrating the cross-disciplinarity that we represent. Um, it was my honor and privilege to have served as co-director of the CLS at the beginning in 2006 with our dear late colleague at Del Michio, and then as director from 2009, really with the support of all of you and amazing group of collaborators and students. So I'm going to try today to very briefly describe some pieces of our research program and to identify some highlights of what we've learned and where I think we're heading. Now, even a fast-talking talk, New Yorker, and despite the fact that I haven't lived in New York in a very long time, I consider myself, my, New York is my L1. And uh, so, and, and at risk of being uh, self-promoting, which is the last intention I have, that if you really want a complete research talk, I was at University of California Merced uh, a couple of months ago to give a talk, um, and they actually filmed it. So I, it's on YouTube. And if you really want a whole research talk with all of the research uh, ins and outs and gory detail, you're welcome to, to take a look at it. I will also point out that anyone who is suffering from the state college uh, stereotype and, and feeling like, oh, we're in the middle of nowhere out here, um, you can go visit 
with Merced. Um, and Merced, <laughs> Merced is lovely, but it makes State College look like a metropolis. Okay. Um, I want to acknowledge just at the start that um, I have had uh, uh, just the uh, really amazing experience uh, where the generosity of my collaborators, my students, uh, and colleagues here and, and elsewhere have, have just made it possible to do this kind of research uh, and research support from a number of different sources. Um, but I particularly want to acknowledge the fabulous graduate students and postdocs with whom I've worked. And the research that I'm going to present today is really it's only a tiny snippet of the larger research program that they have enabled and that they are really developing in different um, directions. I won't be able to mention all of the wonderful undergraduates who work with us, but please know all of the undergraduates who happen to be here that you have made very special contributions to our research. So in the beginning, um, there was Erica Michael and Natasha Tokowitz and Natasha Miller. And yes, there were two graduate students named Natasha in our lab. And just as an anecdote, there was a, a moment where we submitted papers to a conference. And the conference people, organizers, could not believe that there were actually two Natasha. It's OK. There were, that, there were, <laughs> that there were two Natashas. They thought we were trying to sneak in an extra paper by pretending that the two Natashas had different last names. Um, and Gretchen Sunderman, Anna Schwartz, um, Bianca Samutka, who's here. Um, Bianca, why don't you stand up so everyone can <laughs> see you? So Bianca is one of the pioneers in the, in the lab and got her degree in 2003. But there's something I also want you to notice. In the next generation of graduate students, Noriko Hoshino, <coughs> April Jacobs, Susan Bob, Jared Link, Carrie Bogulski, Rhonda McLean, and Jason Gulliver, What's different about these two slides? Do you see how in the second slide, we have all of these co-directing, co-supervision? And so what happened in, in this group is that we went from being a model that was a fairly typical model of graduate student apprenticeship to a model where we were working together. And it was really very typical for graduate students to then have more than one advisor or more than one faculty member with whom they met. And in many respects, these graduate students served as a catalyst for developing faculty collaborations. So the, the, there's wonderful sense in which the community was not only growing in terms of numbers, but growing in terms of its interconnectedness. And then the current graduate student is Kinsey Bice, who poor soul is traveling somewhere in the south of France at the moment. Um, <laughs> Christian Navarro Torres, Haiyan Sang, and Andrea uh, Takahisu Tabori um, are all the graduate students in the lab at the moment. And then we have a wonderful group of postdocs who have worked with us. Eleonora Rossi, uh, Mari Cruz Martin, Fanyang Ma, Melinda Fricke, uh, and Megan uh, Zernstein. And there are two undergraduates who I want to recognize, so I think are here today, um, uh, Akina Lofters and Amy Kinsey, who are just preparing to go off on their prior adventures in another week. OK. The research that we have done um, can be organized around what I've called three discoveries about bilingualism. And in 2014, uh, Susan Bob and Noriko Hoshino and I wrote a paper to try to, try to organize these, these ideas a bit. Um, and, and really review the state of research in the field. Uh, and there are three discoveries that we identified as being central. You've, all of you who've been there on Friday morning have heard this maybe ad nauseum, but I will indulge and, and review uh, one more time. So one idea that you hear a lot is that both languages are always active in competing with one another. In fact, that may be in some ways the most important of these discoveries and the discovery from which all others uh, uh, fall out. Um, the second is that the native language changes in response to learning and using a second language. Many of us who've studied second language learning and bilingualism for a long time know that much of the focus is on the L2. How do you acquire the L2? Can someone who's not a native speaker and learns late, uh, actually acquire sensitivity to all the features of the L2. So a lot of the research in the past has really been focused on those issues. And what we know now is that it's not just the L2 that's changing with uh, 
language learning, it's also the L1. It's the native language. And we've come to think that those native language changes may really be key in understanding uh, the consequences that bilingualism hold. And finally, uh, and, and really the source of the current debate about the bilingual advantage or advantages is that these consequences of bilingualism <laughs> are not limited to language, uh, but also reflect a reorganization of brain networks that hold implications for the ways in which bilinguals negotiate cognitive competition uh, more generally. And so what I want to do uh, today is to try to very, very briefly illustrate a couple of these points and tell you about where we see this heading. Uh, and it, it's going to be very incomplete and, and really very uh, New York uh, or, or maybe uh, Sesame Street style. Um, OK, so one of the issues about discussing the implications of bilingualism is that many people out there want to have a really simple fix on this. Is bilingualism good for you? Well, at some level, bilingualism has to be good for you because you, you have the end result of having two languages that you can use in your life quite independently of whether your cognition or your brain uh, is changed. But in fact, what we know is that um, the, these consequences of bilingualism are complex. They're not simple. Uh, there was a, a op-ed in, in the New York Times a couple of days ago by David Brooks, who was not my favorite op-ed writer, but I'll just... And it, was about, and it was about a political issue that was completely independent of bilingualism, but it had a wonderful title. And it was about a TED talk that someone gave called uh, The Danger of a Simple Story. And it's, a, it's really a wonderful metaphor, I think, for us in thinking about how things have become simplified, oversimplified, in a way that really may be to the detriment of the underlying science. So one of the things that we've been struck by in our group is that many of the critiques of the con on the consequences of bilingualism don't ever talk about language. They talk about cognition, they talk about executive function, but they don't really examine language processes directly. They might ask people to you know, rate themselves on a scale from one to 10, how proficient do you think you are? Uh, but they don't really analyze language very carefully. So the overarching goal of the research in our lab has been to examine the language processes that potentially reveal the interplay between language, cognition, and the brain for second language learners and for highly proficient bilinguals. And this is, a, this is a slide you've seen over and over again. I couldn't resist having it yet one more, one last time for you. Um, so this is our prototypical Dutch English speaker. Uh, and the question is, how do you decide what to call this very, very common object? And the idea is that if you're bilingual, you have at least two ways that you can name the object. And many people think that it's this selection, this necessity to the, the need to choose how you're going to call something that really may be underlying many of the cognitive consequences that we observe. And the metaphor that I, I put out there that's sort of uh, been picked up by the media in some dangerous ways is that um, the bilingual is a, men bilingual is a men mental juggler, that the bilingual is constantly dealing with the activation of the two languages. And this is just an illustration from an old study. This is one that Anna Schwartz and Michelle, is Michelle here? Um, Michelle Diaz, who you all know very well, uh, was an undergraduate here at Penn State. She was actually the uh, student marshal in psychology in uh, 1999. And this is a study on which she collaborated. Um, and this is a study, a very, very simple study. Um, we simply asked uh, bilinguals to name words in their two languages, for English and Spanish. And we simply recorded behavioral study how long it took them to name these words. The, the trick in the study is that the words were sometimes cognates. And when they were cognates, they could either have similar or different phonology in the two languages. Now, the phonology is never identical, but the idea was that the pronunciation of the, the cognate could be very similar, as in piano, piano, or bass and basse, which are very different. And the question is, what's the consequence of the language not in use 
when you're reading in one language only. And this study, like many, many other studies from many other labs over this period of time, showed that when bilinguals were reading in even one language alone, the other language, it's almost like having a ghost in the machine, right? The other language is always there and intruding even when you're not aware of it. And so what happened here is that what we found is that the time to begin to speak words in the language you were speaking in, always in English or always in Spanish, was influenced by whether or not the phonology of its mate in the other language, of its cognate pair, was similar or not. When the phonology converged, people were fast. When the phonology conflicted, they were slow. And this happened both in the first language and in the second language. And what we know now is that these cross-language interactions are persistent. We see them even when bilinguals are processing words and sentences, which is extremely counterintuitive. We see it even when they're not required to use one of the two languages at all in a given context. And we see it even when the bilinguals are highly proficient. We used to think this was a phenomenon that was related to developing proficiency. So if you're a learner and you come into your class the first day, of course the, the, your native language is going to be active and intruding. And what we now know is that this is something that's, that's still present even for proficient speakers and even for language pairings that are highly dissimilar. Uh, in a study with our uh, Pyre partner, Jill Morford, um, we uh, uh, reported an experiment where uh, deaf signers were read words in English. And these were uh, highly proficient university students who were highly proficient in English. But remember that for uh, a deaf individual who has uh, signed from the time they were very little, that English is really their L2. So they are, in fact, bimodal bilinguals. And the question we asked was whether when they saw English words, they were implicitly activating the translation of those English words in American Sign Language. Now, American Sign Language doesn't look anything like English. <laughs> And what we found is that when we had sign language translations that shared phonological features, things like hand shape or placement, that what we saw is that when there was a conflict between those features of the sign uh, and whether they had to say yes or no to these English words, whether they were semantically related or not, which was the task, what we found is that these deaf signers were sensitive to that conflict, whereas a monolingual English speaker reading these sentences shows no effect of that at all. And what the result, and many other studies have been done using this kind of approach, that what we, what we see is that the translation in the native language, even when the native language is vastly different than the second language in terms of its structure, is still available and active. So, what does that do? What is the consequence of that parallel activation and competition? What happens to this mental juggler? The hypothesis is that juggling two languages may tune the brain networks that enable cognitive control and that build cognitive reserve. So bilinguals, the hypothesis is that bilinguals are uh, experts in resolving competition across the two languages and that that expertise becomes something that grows beyond the use of the language itself. And so how does it do that? Uh, there's a, a, this story is a, a lovely, simple story. And until very recently, it was really the sort of received wisdom for why we might see a bilingual advantage. Bilinguals struggle the two languages. They have to keep them separate under some circumstances. They have to resolve this competition to get on with their lives and be able to speak the language they intend to speak. Uh, and, and so how, how does that happen and what, what, is, what are the consequences? And what we now know is that that may very well be an element of the uh, reason we see these uh, cognitive uh, advantages for bilingual, but it can't possibly be that simple. And so being bilingual is not only, as I said before, about uh, using the L2 and juggling the two languages, it's also about the consequences that that juggling has for the native language. Now, I don't have time today to go into the many imaging studies that have been reported in the literature. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not 
the same areas of the brain are active when both each of the two languages um, are, are used. And what we now know is that the two languages are not represented separately in the brain. That uh, it, to a large extent, when we see differences for bilinguals, uh, and what we see is we see that the areas that are responsible for cognitive control in the brain tend to be the areas that are differentiating the weaker or less dominant language from the stronger or more dominant language. But we see that the same basic neural tissue is supporting both languages. And the, one of the consequences is that the native language may take a hit. And this is a very counterintuitive, I mean, it's a sort of frightening idea if you're, if you're a learner and you think that you may somehow lose something in the process of learning a second language. We know from studies that we and others have done that when learners are immersed in a second language environment during study abroad or when traveling, and this is not to scare any of the Pyre students, um, but we know that when you're immersed that there is suppression of the native language. I don't have time today to go into the evidence, but uh, there is, the evidence is really quite, quite uh, impressive and reliable for that. We also know that when proficient bilinguals speak their first language, after speaking their second language, there is a momentary suppression of the first language, even when they're highly proficient. And the claim that we and others want to make is that bilinguals learn to regulate their native language in order to establish and achieve proficient performance in the second language. And that regulation process may really be a crucial part of what produces these so-called bilingual advantages. And this is just, just a, again, a, a tiny little illustration from a study that many of you have heard reported now many times. Uh, this was a study together with Maya Misra, uh, Talmay Guo, Susan Bob. Uh, this is an ERP study. And again, it was utterly simple. We asked bilinguals, and these were Chinese English bilinguals, we asked them simply, name a bunch of pictures in your native language, name a bunch of pictures in your second language. Or the reverse, name a bunch of pictures in your second language, and then name a bunch of pictures in your native language. And all we did was to look at the consequences of the order in which they named. And in this particular study, we actually repeated the same items. And when you repeat the same items, you expect there to be some benefit, some facilitation later on. And just to cut to the chase here, what we found in the ERP data is that's exactly what we found in the second language. We found in the second language that if I showed you a set of pictures that you named in your native language, and then you name them in your second language, you see this sort of facilitation. You see reduced negativity in the ERP record for the second language. What we found that was surprising is that in the native language, we found the opposite. We found that in the native language, there was increased negativity. If you had just spoken the L2, there was this effect of having then spoken the L2 on the L1. And initially, we thought, well, people recover really quickly. One or two times speaking your native language, you're back back on track, and that's not what happened. And in fact, I often say we, we can't hope no one is here from the IRB. Um, we, we ruined these people for the purpose of the study. So the, it turned out in this experiment that by the end of the experiment, they had not recovered. But they were still showing this inhibitory pattern, and the experiment was not designed to look at the, you know, the time course of this effect. But what it suggests is that there is uh, there, there is inhibitory control that's required for even highly proficient speakers to use their native language after they've spoken the second language. Uh, we've replicated this in, uh, in a behavioral study. This is a study by an undergraduate uh, honors student uh, uh, here at, at Penn State. And uh, what we found, we simply had Japanese English bilinguals uh, speak the L1 and then speak the L2 or the reverse. Japanese English bilinguals, even those here immersed at Penn State, are dominant in Japanese. Okay, they do not lose, they, they hang together. They don't lose their Japanese dominance. Okay, what we found was that when they speak their, their L1 and then their L2, do you see how the black bar is less than the red bar? They're faster in Japanese than 
than in English. No big deal, nothing to write home about. They're Japanese dominant, they're faster to speak Japanese. Okay. What happens when we ask them to speak Japanese after they've just spoken English? They are now slower to speak Japanese than to speak English. We've managed to reverse the dominance relationship between the two languages, at least temporarily. And so what all of this suggests is it suggests that there's a very important role for how the native language functions in bilinguals and second language learners. And just very, very quickly, in a recent study that uh, Kinsey uh, and I published, um, we, and in a project that Julie and I have uh, grant funding for now, working with a whole uh, group of you uh, here, uh, we've been exploring the hypothesis that this regulation of the L1 might be a clue that we need to take seriously in thinking about late second language learning. So what we see is that for proficient bilinguals, we see this regulation of the native language. So the hypothesis that we have uh, is that good second language learners, good adult second language learners, may be individuals who are able to sort of tolerate that change to their native language, to take that hit in a way. And so we have a, a study underway to look at the way the native language changes over time longitudinally in learners, um, uh, in this case, uh, native English speakers who are learning Spanish. In this study that we recently published, what Kinsey showed is that if you asked uh, English learners of Spanish uh, to make lexical decisions, just decide is this word, uh, tomato, is this a real word in English, um, what we did is we asked whether or not early in learning, if we were to measure uh, the EEG, whether early in learning we could see effects of the second language on the first. In the past, we had thought, well, you're only going to see effects of your second language on your first language after you've become really proficient in the second language. You need that proficiency for it to sort of get through. And critically, what we see in this study is we see effects of the second language on the first language almost from the beginning. In this EEG study, what we find is we find that uh, intermediate, we, we have beginning and intermediate learners of Spanish, but note that all of you who are in the Spanish department and teach intermediate students know that those intermediate learners of Spanish are still pretty beginning. So these are all people who are relative. You would, you would not by a stretch of anybody's imagination call any of them proficient. OK, so what we see is in reaction time, we see nothing. They look like monolinguals. They show no sensitivity. They're responding in English. Doesn't look like the Spanish is affecting them. But what happens when we look at the ERP record is we see effects of the second language beginning to creep into the data. And so what we see is very early in learning, we're seeing these effects of the second language on the first. And so one of the, one of the ideas now in this uh, grant project underway is to really explore the hypothesis that there may be not only, uh, uh, and this may, may not only be evidence for this kind of regulation of the native language, but there may be individual differences in how different learners are able to do that. And those individual differences may then have consequences for uh, <coughs> successful outcomes in the L2. Okay, in uh, this idea of regulation uh, are, is a theme uh, in projects that uh, two of the postdocs here have been exploring. Uh, Megan Zernstein has been looking at uh, the ability to regulate uh, the L1 in proficient speakers uh, of a number of different uh, language combinations uh, together with cognitive control ability to show that native-like uh, L native-like uh, uh, performance by late L2 learners um, may, in fact, be predicted by how able they are to regulate the L1 in combination with their cognitive control. And she's been examining this in a paradigm, looking at uh, prediction in uh, reading text. Um, Melinda Fricke has been also looking at uh, prediction processes as being central to code switching, a topic that's of interest to many of you uh, in, the, in the CLS. And the idea being that bilinguals come to align with one another uh, in discourse and exploit very subtle phonetic cues that anticipate uh, code switch utterance. Um, okay, there's, there's so much that we don't know. We could be here the rest of the 
afternoon and evening just trying to lay it all out, but I'm just going to mention a few things. Um, we don't know how bilingual someone needs to be to show these effects. Um, we, there is a lot that we don't know about the context of language use. So whether someone is bilingual in a context where there is a minority language or not, uh, whether there is support for bilingualism in the community in which a person lives and works. Uh, we don't really know what the consequences of age of acquisition are. There's a lot of speculation. There's a lot of recent neuroimaging data, both structural and functional data on this issue. Um, we don't really know whether these consequences are similar for all the language tasks that a bilingual performs and how those consequences may then spill over to cognition. Um, we also don't really know enough about monolinguals. And uh, that may sound like a surprising thing to say because we tend to think of monolinguals as vanilla. Um, but in fact, not all monolinguals are the same. And there are a number of recent studies that uh, really, really demonstrate that. And it's, it's one of the things I'll just say that one of the issues that we're very excited about in moving to Southern California is that we think that we can partner with all of you in doing studies where we compare our monolinguals here and in a much more linguistically diverse environment and really ask the question of how that diversity of the environment affects performance. And uh, those of you who are at the Cognitive Brown Bag today and heard um, Andrea's talk, um, w there are fantastic results about uh, bilingual learning babies, babies who are exposed to two languages from early on. We know almost nothing about how the consequences of those early experiences map on or endure later, later in life, what, how language history uh, really, really impacts uh, later language uh, use. And all of this is really exciting. So the bilingual may be a mental juggler, um, but we are only really beginning to identify the factors that might eventually provide a comprehensive account of bilingualism and its consequences. The message is not to scare everyone away and say, oh, this is really complicated. It is complicated. Um, but it's also very exciting and I think holds enormous promise for revealing fundamental principles about language and cognition and its neural basis. And we would know none of this if we studied monolinguals alone. And the interest is not just because bilingualism is interesting, which it is, um, it's that it really requires a revision of the traditional stories that we in all of these fields that we, we work in uh, tell about language development, about uh, cognitive control, and about the plasticity associated with language experience. Now, before I end, there are many people in the <coughs> Penn State community who've provided resources and enthusiasm for our vision of language science, and I want to end today by acknowledging a few of them. So I'd like to acknowledge Susan Welsh, the dean uh, in the College of Liberal Arts, for giving us an opportunity to show that although we were a group of our own invention, uh, that was the nicest way I could say it, um, that the college would provide support for us to make a go of it. In my very first conversation with her about the center in 2006, she said, we'll give you a little support for three years, and then you have to show that you can run with it. Um, so I think that was, an, that was a, a vote of confidence um, that really got us started. Susan McHale, who's the director of the SSRI, the Social Science Research Institute here on campus, uh, has provided critical support for us to go the next step to encourage us to build cross-disciplinary connections uh, and to compete for external funding that we would not have thought possible in 2006. And uh, at the administrative level, finally, Denise Solomon, when she was associate dean in the college uh, for enabling the process of the dual title degree in language science, for holding our hands when we were in the Thomas basement, uh, and for creatively increasing the base of support for CLS graduate programs. Uh, we did survive the Thomas basement, what I call the dungeon. Uh, and you can, for those of you who weren't there, uh, it's been renovated. So you, it's, 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 yeah, I, I, I've told some of you when I went back and looked at it, it was a little bit like being in one of these science fiction movies where, you know, you had some like horrific experience in prison and then you go back to visit the site of the, your imprisonment and it's been turned into a five, five star hotel and you think, oh my God, I'm really crazy. But this is what it really, this is what it looked like. Um, and and there, were some, there were some 
silver linings in that uh, in, the, in that context, we didn't have much air. We didn't have much light. Uh, you can, there were, it was very, very hard to have any kind of privacy. These were all the sound attenuated chambers all lined up together. We were really all squished in. But there was something about being squished in that was really terrific. Um, and when we moved to the Moore building, um, I basically said, it's not negotiable. All the graduate students of CLS have to be together. We have to be together. We have to have that physical proximity uh, to be able to interact with one another. Uh, a big thank you to Sharon Elder, uh, who helped us survive the dungeon by imagining that we had our own island in the middle of campus. <laughs> um, I acknowledge that the Thomas basement did bring out some qualities that I didn't even know I possessed. Uh, <laughs> Um, I might want to pass that on to the rest of you for thinking about what you might need, what, what kinds of attire you might need in the future. Um, I want to thank all the CLS faculty and pre-CLS faculty who belong to the Langer Science Research Group and have worked together to shape the vision and community that is the CLS today. Um, for all the grad students, postdocs, and new faculty in the audience, what Eric Silver didn't say is we wrote many grants together that were rejected. Um, and you know, you hear that and you think, oh, you know, right, the typical, how am I ever going to get through? And I want to say that we did not fail. We did not fail because that process of working together taught us really crucial lessons about our strengths and weaknesses and about each other. We learned what we could contribute. And in working together, we were able to shape the vision of what we were going to be. Um, it was that process, in many respects, I will argue, that brought us to these two pyrograms that have so enhanced the context of CLS research and training. Um, and that it was painful. It was, it's not fun to be rejected, uh, as all of us know. Um, but there was something important about persisting and about working together and about learning how to talk and write together um, and to openly craft uh, vision and to sustain community. We need to be able to disagree with each other publicly in a respectful way. We need to learn how to have that kind of sparring and discussion and we also need to be generous to each other. This is, you, there was one of the slides that, that went through. This was the Language Science Research Group in 2005. This was what Friday mornings looked like in 2005. <coughs> uh, it's shocking, I know. Uh, it's really, um, uh, yeah, Matt is in, in, uh, in Spain, but you can see he was, he was a graduate student here at the, at the time. Uh, and Carol is here, Susan Bob, Tracy Kramer, Jared Link. Um, your student. Yes. Um, Geraldine <laughs> Blattner. Right. Geraldine, Geraldine Blattner, Blattner uh, Chip Gerfen, uh, Maya Misra. Right. We were a tiny group. And the truth was, and the story that uh, Julie was telling, okay. we, were, we had met in the Purple Lab, and then we moved into this other room because we were a fire hazard. Um, and that was when we realized we had to become the language science research group. Um, of, Note a very special thanks to the CLS faculty who worked tirelessly to craft the dual title doctoral degree, and you're all, I know you're all here. Um, Phil Baldy and uh, Carol Miller and Richard Page. Um, this was all of you who are graduate students and who have benefited from this fabulous program and from the series of pro seminars and the opportunity to do lab rotations. Uh, this was a, a vision that was worked on in, what, 2009, something like that? 2008, 2009, um, and, and went through many uh, iterations. And uh, I would say, dare say that we sort of pulled some things out of the hat that we invented at the time, uh, and that you are the, either the victims or you know, beneficiaries of that uh, creativity. Um, and above all, a very heartfelt thanks um, to Julie Ducius, who was always there to work together, to discuss all problems, and to face them together with strength and humor. I couldn't find, I looked and I looked for the pictures of us in our pajamas, in the breakfast room, in a hotel in Barcelona. We were at the AMLAP meeting, and the prior grant was due the next week. And we knew we had to stay up all night to work on that grant. And the damn hotel we were in said, you can't turn the lights on in the breakfast room. And we begged, and we, they let us 
turn on one light in the breakfast room, and we sat in the breakfast room of the hotel the whole night working on the, on the grant. And Julie understands that there's no task that's uh, too large or too small, uh, what it means to celebrate community and each other, and really to model the ways that sharing and cooperation benefit us all. She's an extraordinary colleague and friend. And to my partner and love of almost 40 years, who is a model of what it means to be an intellectual, to speak your mind openly, and some of you in the cognitive area will particularly appreciate this, to ask the questions that everyone's thinking but too afraid to ask, uh, and always to be ready for a new adventure. Um, I thank all of you for this tremendous honor today uh, and for this very, very special moment. Um, I welcome the partnership with the CLS in the future in this next chapter uh, of my, my work as I move to California. There's going to be a new job at uh, University of California Riverside, and we have some very special little people who we're looking forward to interacting with.